We're ready to go. Okay. Just make sure everybody can hear. Why is this clicking? Can everybody hear us? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. We can hear you. Thank you all. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Councilwoman Joanne Ryan. I'd like to welcome you to the Committee on Finance, a regular meeting. Uh, this is Tuesday, February 1st, 2022. Um, it is just 5.31. Um, Madam Clerk, would you kindly read the roll? Chairwoman Ryan? Present. Vice Chairwoman Castillo? Present. Councilman Nanducci? Here. Councilwoman Anthony? Present. Councilman Taylor? Here. We have five present, we have a quorum. Wonderful, thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, I see we have Chief Mancini with us. I see we have <coughs> Director uh, Silveria. Uh, I'm not seeing our uh, legal counsel. Is he on yet? Okay. All right, we won't do anything that will require legal counsel <laughs> advice. Okay, folks, um, I think what I'd like to do um, to so that our appointees don't have to stay uh, for an extended period of time, um, I think I'd like to entertain a motion to take matters out of order. Um, I would like to start this evening on um, item two and then work our way through the uh, agenda and take item one last, if that's acceptable. May I have that motion? So move. Motion made by Vice Chair Castillo, seconded by? Second motion. Seconded by Councilman Narducci, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Ayes have it, motion carries. Madam Clerk, could you kindly read item two into the record? Communication from His Honor the Mayor dated January 6, 2022, informing the honorable members of the City Council that pursuant to sections 302B and 814 of the Province Home Charter of 1980, as amended in Public Law, Chapter 45 50, Sections 1 through 31, passed in 1987, he is this day appointing Jonathan Salinger of 89 Laurel Avenue, Providence, Rhode Island, 02906, as a member of the Board of Tax Assessment and Review. Return to expire on January 31st, 2024, and respectfully submits the same for your approval. Thank you. Mr. Salinger, are you with us? He's muted. Yes, I am. Muted, I just sir. Muted. I'm here. I'm here. Wonderful. Uh, Wonderful. Okay, we're going to have the clerk swear you in, please. Jonathan, please raise your right hand to swear under the penalty and perjury that the testimony that you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall help you God. I do. Please state your name and where you're from, please. Uh, Jonathan Salinger, Providence, Rhode Island. Wonderful. Committee members, do you have his uh, uh, resume in your packet? Everybody received their packet, committee members? Anybody yes. who didn't? Yes. Just shout out. Okay, great. Welcome, Mr. Salinger. I Thank said you. to the clerks just a little while ago, Jonathan Salinger, I know that man. <laughs> it's been a while, Jonathan, but good to see you. Thank you. So, Thank you. Um, welcome, truly, to the Finance Committee. Uh, I'm uh, very familiar with your experience. Uh, so I see you're being appointed to the tax assessment, board of tax assessment and review of, and review on um, for a term to expire January 31, 2024. Could you kindly um, present to the committee on um, your background, your experience, you're interested in the tax re review uh, commission. Uh, tell us about yourself if you wouldn't mind. Sure, well, I mean, I'm, first of all, I'm a, I grew up in Providence, so I'm from Providence. Um, I, I went to Martin Luther King, Gordon, Moses Brown, and Wheeler, and uh, you know I've been helping people um, purchase homes and refinance their homes for the last um, gosh 29 and a half years in the market. Um, so you know I've been pretty involved in real estate, and you know over the years, um, you know obviously people have asked my advice when it comes to things like their tax assessment, and you know as you know people don't always like to pay taxes, but we need to pay taxes because cities don't pay for themselves. 
And, uh, you know, I've many times tried to explain to them it's, a, it's actually a very fair system, even though maybe it doesn't reflect today's market value. And I think that's one of the reasons why I was interested in being, you know, on the, on the committee. And it's because, you know, taxes need to be fair. And what fair means is not necessarily what I think it's worth today, but fair compared to what was assessed to your neighbors. Nobody should get, you know, have a superior property and pay less, right? I mean, it should be spread around fairly. And I think if we want people to have confidence in government, they need to understand that we, you know, we collect their money fairly and hopefully we spend it wisely. So, you know, to the respect of where I've got areas of experience you know i actually appealed taxes on a property i owned in providence gosh over over 20 almost 30 years ago 25 years ago and won that appeal um you know by pre presenting good evidence and showing that an error had been made you know and i encourage other people if you're not happy with your assessment instead of complaining about it simply go do some research so anyway you know something i know about i have some passion for it and i love my city so here i am you know wonderful Committee members, any comments, questions for Mr. Salinger? I see Councilwoman Anthony has her hand up. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to thank you for, uh, for wanting to serve your city. Um, you have an excellent background and um, I think you'll be a very valuable addition. So thank you. Well, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> any other questions, committee members, council just members? Just a comment. I want to congratulate you. I wish you the best of luck. Oh, yeah. I might need some with the next yes. round. So thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Thank you, Councilman Nanducci. Anyone else? Jonathan, I'd like to take this opportunity to say good luck. <laughs> we wish you well. I echo my colleagues, uh, Councilman Anthony's comments. Um, thank you for willing to step up and serve uh, our city. Um, this is important work, um, and I know from working with you in the past how absolutely wonderful you are about sharing your experience. Um, you, you are a tremendously talented uh, person. You've been in the industry a long time. Unfortunately, I've been in it longer than you. <laughs> but I, uh, I always relied on you through the years, uh, and you've been so willing uh, to provide some uh, 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 expert advice, if you will. So I think it's a great fit. I'm really excited to see you appointed to this board. Um, and that, um, I would like to uh, entertain a motion to uh, recommend approval of this appointment. Motion made, motion made by yeah. Vice Chair Castillo, seconded by Councilman Narducci. All in favor, aye. aye. Any opposed, ayes have it, motion carries. <laughs> Mr. Salinger, thank you again. Your appointment will now go before the full council for a vote uh, at the next, Madam Clerk, at the next council meeting, second. or no? Second? The second the second uh, council meeting in uh, February. So best right. of luck, Jonathan, and we hope uh, stay connected. Reach out to council people because um, they will be reaching out to you for your guidance uh, along the way. Thank you very much. That's great, thank you. And you guys have a great evening. Same to you, Jonathan. Okay. Um, Madam Clerk, could you please read item three into the record? Communication from the Honor of the Mayor, dated January 12, 2022. Informing the honorable members of the City Council that pursuant to sections 302B and 1011 of the Province Home Charter of 1980, as amended in public law, the chapter 45-50, sections one through 31, Passed in 1987, he is a state appointing Manuel Cordero Alvarado of 48 Hammond Street, Providence, Rhode Island, 02909, as a member of the City Plan Commission for term to expire on January 31st, 2027, and respectfully submits the same for your approval. Thank you very much. Manuel Cordero Alvarado, are you with us this evening? Beautiful. Yeah, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Um, Madam Clerk, could you kindly uh, swear in Mr. Uh, Alvarado? May you please raise your right hand? Do you swear to kind of the perjury that the testimony they are going to give is the truth, the whole truth, and have the truth to help you, God? I do. You say your name for the record and where you live, please. Uh, Manuel Cordero Alvarado, 48 Hammond, Providence, Rhode Island. 
Okay, sir. So this uh, is an appointment by the um, mayor to uh, the city plan commission. City plan commission is a charter uh, commission, charter established commission. It's a very important commission and one that uh, is uh, relied upon by this council, particularly in zoning matters and other matters that uh, come before us that we rely upon you for your uh, this commission for their guidance and in uh, direction. Uh, so please tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, um, your interest in serving on the City Plan Commission, um, and why you're here today. Thank you, Madam Chair uh, and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name again is Manuel Cordero Alvarado, uh, born and raised uh, in Puerto Rico, actually, uh, but uh, a uh, now Rhode Islander and and uh, I consider myself a little bit of a Providence uh, almost native uh, going on 15 years uh, living here in Providence uh, architect by training uh, but uh, even though I practiced early in my career actually spent a good amount of the last decade uh, at the school building authority at the Rhode Island Department of Education overseeing school construction for the state of Rhode Island uh, so kind of deeply embedded in public service and uh, have always uh, really believed in uh, my role and responsibility as a citizen and, and serving and using my skill sets. Uh, and certainly the City Plan Commission is a great opportunity to do so well aligned, uh, as I mentioned, with uh, my knowledge and skill sets in architecture and planning. Uh, but also an area where I feel like there's a lot of uh, good work to be done. Uh, I have since uh, just about a year ago started my own practice uh, with doing a mix of design, uh, planning, and uh, community engagement services, uh, and also uh, teach at uh, the Rowan School of Design in the architecture department at, at Brown in the urban planning department. Wonderful. Committee members, any questions? Councilwoman Anthony. Um, I was just wondering, do we have um, your resume? I, I don't see it in our packet. I, I, I'm i not sure what was shared, but I am happy to uh, hear that uh, or answer any questions about uh, CV. Was it uh, not? Yeah. Madam Chair, I have it in my packet. Anthony, it was, it was distributed in a packet. It was in my packet that I received. If you I don't, don't have it on, in your packet. I don't see it online. You, so if, if somebody yeah, could just okay. send it to me at some point online, I'd appreciate it. Um, Great. Certainly not going to hold up my, my uh, support this evening. I wanted to thank you so much for wanting to serve the city <laughs> in this capacity. Um, as our chairwoman said, it's, 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 a, it's a big lift on CPC, and we do rely on uh, the CPC's opinion in many, in many, in many regards. Um, I guess I'd just like to know a little more about your uh, your practice. I know you said you're teaching, but um, what are you, do you have, who do you have for, I mean, I'm, I'll just cut to the chase. Do you see, see any potential conflicts of interest? Uh, no, uh, that's a great question. Uh, thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, my practice is a little bit different than a kind of traditional architecture practice. Uh, I, I tend to do a lot of uh, pre-planning services uh, and uh, a lot of my work actually is in the educational field. Uh, given my background uh, at the School Building Authority, I am working with a lot of districts, helping them with planning around school construction, uh, mostly in other districts. Uh, uh, you know, my paths sometimes cross with uh, with uh, the Providence School District, uh, and certainly would recuse myself in any instance that 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 might come before the board. Uh, but uh, other than that, I, my work uh, fortunately uh, does not have much potential for conflict. Thank you. Wonderful. All set, Councilwoman. Thank Anyone you. else? Anyone else? Committee members, council members. Okay. Well, I would like, first of all, I'd like to recognize Councilman Vargas is, is with us. We have Councilwoman, uh, Councilor Miller has joined us. We also have Councilor Kerwin is with us. 
I don't see anyone else. Oh, no. Thank you very much. Didn't mean to interrupt there. Um, so your resume is, is fantastic. And um, I do want to thank you for your uh, willingness to serve our city in this really important role. Um, I served on the CPC. As a matter of fact, that's pretty much why I decided I wanted to run for a council. So um, I see maybe perhaps a council seat is, is in the future for you. Um, but certainly well qualified on um, you do. It's a heavy lift this job. Uh, it's important work. We rely on you on. Um, I would recommend you unhesitantly on uh, your background is remarkable. Um, with that, I would like to uh, entertain a motion to recommend approval to the council. So May I have that motion? Motion made by Vice Chair Castillo, seconded by. Second. Seconded by Councilwoman Anthony. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Ayes have it. Motion carries. You are all set on uh, motion uh, passed. Uh, you will go before the full council. Uh, so please make sure you uh, introduce yourself to other council members. Uh, and the vote will be the second uh, meeting in February. It's the 17th. The, uh, Madam Clerk has just advised. Wish you well and thank you again. Thank you kindly. Okay. On um, Madam Clerk, could you please read item four into the record? Certificates from City Assessor 57D and 58D recommending the same be separately canceled pursuant to the provisions of section 14 and 15 of Title 44, Chapter 7 of the General Laws of Rhode Island as amended. Thank you very much. So we have a substitution, correct, for this item four? That is correct. Um, that's also in the committee's packet this evening. So I think we need to uh, enter the substitution. I'd like to entertain that motion to substitute. Uh, okay, wonderful uh, motion made by uh, Vice Chair Castillo, seconded by. Second motion, Madam Chair. By Councilman Narducci, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes carry, Mo motion carries, thank you. Um, all right, so we have the substitution. Um, who's gonna speak on this topic? Um, uh, Madam Chair, um, yes. our assessor was unable to make it um, tonight, but it is my understanding that she met um, with the internal auditor prior to the meeting to go through um, item number four and item number five. Um, okay. All right. Um, thank you very much, Director Silveria. Um, Madam Auditor. Can you confirm that you've had the opportunity to review this matter, item four, um, yes, sir. with the assessor and everything is in order and appropriate? Yes, Madam Chair, I did review it to her and um, I have no issues with the item. Okay, so this is 57D and 58D. Okay, council members, anybody have any questions, concerns about this that they'd like to speak about now? Okay, with that, I'd like to uh, uh, entertain a motion to uh, approve item four. So moved. As, as sub the substitution of item four. Um, motion made by Councilwoman Castillo, seconded by Councilman Narducci. Second motion. <laughs> All in favor, aye. Any opposed, ayes have it. Motion carries. Okay, so that's four. Madam Clerk, please read item five into the record. Certificates from City of Bethard 59E and 60E recommending the same be separately canceled pursuant to the provisions of section 14 and 15 of Title 44, Chapter 7 of the General Laws of Rhode Island as amended. Okay, same, same questions, Director Silveria. Um, can you again speak for the administration that these are all in appropriate order, properly done? Um, they are, Madam Chair. And again, um, Esther was able to meet with the internal auditor um, prior to this meeting to review this item as well. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Director Silveria. Madam Auditor, uh, could you please opine on your review of item five? Uh, yes, I did review it. And I just want to bring to the council's attention that these items, um, you'll notice that a lot of them are for owner occupancy. I believe this up the matter of the recertification of uh, homestead occupancy exemption. Um, so that is why that's pretty heavy in, in there. And that was, I thank you. 
conversations, okay? Thank you very much for that clarification. That's very helpful. With that, may I, any questions, concerns, council committee members, council members? Uh, may I entertain a motion, please, to um, approve item five? So motion. Moved. Motion made by Vice Chair Castillo, seconded by Councilman Narducci. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. Okay, so that's four and five. Okay, that now takes us to the top. Uh, <clears throat> Madam Clerk, kindly read item one into the record, please. The ordinance adopting the American Rescue Plan Act grant budget for the period of January 6, 2022 through December 31st, 2024. Presentation and overview of the affordable housing goals for the city. The following have been invited. Bonnie Nickerson, Director of Department of Planning and Development, and Emily Friedman, Director of Division of Community Development, Department of Planning and Development, and presentation and overview of revenue recovery. The following has been invited. Sarah Silveria, Director of Finance. Wonderful. Okay, folks, so um, why don't we swear everybody that, swear everyone in that is going to testify on these two items. Uh, and is Diana Perdomo with us? I saw, her I saw her earlier. Oh, there she is. How's your voice, by the way? Did you get it back? Um, I'm feeling great today. Thank you. Good. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Okay. So you did the heavy work. You did the heavy lifting last meeting. So now uh, the departments are, are going to uh, carry the carry the ball. But I would like you to be engaged this evening, if you wouldn't mind. So please uh, join the swearing in ceremony. And anyone else on the administration team that feels like they would uh, like to field questions, Madam Clerk. Please, everybody, raise your right hand. Do you swear on the penalty of perjury that the testimony they are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. I yeah. do. Now. Lawrence J. Mansi, Chief Financial Officer, City of Providence. Sarah Silveria, uh, Finance Director. Crystal Lindbergh, uh, Deputy Finance Director. Bonnie Nickerson, City Planning Director. Emily Friedman, Department of Planning and Development, Housing and Community Development Division Director. Diana Perdomo, Chief of Policy. Is that it? Okay, good. Okay, um, we have some exhibits, right? Exhibit, uh, <laughs> this should be five, five and six, it sorry. Be, yeah, one okay. exhibit, it's number five, yeah. Okay. Um, I need to add an exhibit to the uh, to the record. Just so they get some screen. Oh, you're so good. Okay, this is going to be exhibit five. Um, it is a letter from Bonnie Nickerson, our director of planning and development, dated February one. Honorable members of the Providence City Council, um, Providence Housing Trust Fund activities is the reason. Um, and you have this in your packet and anybody who doesn't uh, has the information before you. May I have a motion to make this exhibit five for our discussion this evening? I move. Motion made by Vice Chair Castillo. Seconded by? I can't see anybody. Second, I need a second, second. on this exhibit. Second the motion. Second by Councilman Narducci. All in favor, aye. Any opposed, ayes have it. Motion carries. Okay, we have exhibit five. Uh, we also have another exhibit and it is the anti-displacement and comprehensive housing strategy of the city of Providence. Uh, it is a comprehensive document. <laughs> uh, it's quite large. Uh, this is, is it 74 pages? appears to be 74, 75 pages. Um, we're gonna call this exhibit six. May I have that motion? So move. Motion made by Vice Chair Castillo, seconded by Council Narducci, all in favor, aye. Any opposed, aye, have it. Motion carries. So there's two housing exhibits, housing related exhibits. Okay, um, let's get started on the housing topic. Um, we also have a prior exhibit, and I don't know what exhibit number it is. 
but it is the famous 313 page PowerPoint presentation um, and housing begins on page 178 of that big packet that you have. Very good packet, by the way, a lot of information in there. And it's very helpful that now we have page numbers on it. Um, so let's get started on um, Bonnie Nickerson, our Director of Planning and Development. Um, I'd like to uh, offer you the mic and um, let you begin the presentation um, however you would like to. And okay. anyone else that would like to join in, you're, you're welcome to do so. Great, thanks so much. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee and other council members and, and staff. Is it helpful if I share my screen or does everyone have the document in front of them? I'm open to whatever is easiest for folks. Are you talking about the 313-page uh, document? Yes. Housing yes. starting on 178. If you'd like to share and drive, please do so. That'd be great. Okay, Just happy to do that. Is everyone able to see that? Yes, we can. Okay, great. That's page one, right? Yes. Yes. I'm not sure which page number it is for you all, but uh, we'll just we'll just pretend it's page one. So um, I'll just I'll just start talking in general, and then please, uh, Madam Chair, interrupt me with any questions or to pause for any discussion. Um, but I, I just wanted to give this overview. Um, so as as you've seen in the proposed budget, we have allocated 19 million dollars to support the construction of affordable housing units, and within that 19 million dollars, we carved out a subset of $2 million that's specific to permanent supportive housing. Um, so as you can see here, the, the intent is really to create an additional subsidy pool um, within the Providence Housing Trust to accelerate production of affordable units, to get as many units in our pipeline as fast as we can throughout Providence so, neighborhoods. So director, I'm sorry, um, yeah. help me with math. We don't see any math on the screen. What math are you referring to? It's just so for the benefit of my committee. So are you trying to tell us what, what the balance is in the affordable housing trust funds are you able that you're to trying that to augment? Are you, are you seeing the slide that has the 17 and that's 2 million? No. Um, I'm sorry, for some reason. Are you just seeing the intro slide? Yeah, just, just the we, we see Opera Housing Production Investments, Bonnie Nickerson, City Planning Director, okay. uh, dated January 18. Well, for some reason, my if I do, if I'm sorry, everyone, if I do this view, are you able to see it? Are you able to see the change of slide here? Yep. Yes. Okay. So I'll just take Perfect. it out. Okay, I'll Thank take you. it out of slideshow mode and we'll just, you can just look at the screen this way if that's okay. So, um, okay, so sorry about that. Um, so going back to this slide, so what we had proposed in the budget is to carve out $19 million to support affordable housing construction. And as you can see here, within that 19 million, we created a subset that was specific, a specific carve out for permanent supportive housing development. And so that's what we're reflecting here on this first slide. So as I mentioned really- the So for the benefit, I'm sorry, for the benefit of my committee and everybody else on the, in the opera ordinance, you're referring to uh, under the uh, total funding for housing and homelessness at 28.1 uh, million, 17 is the first 17 million is the affordable housing development PRA transfer. And at the very bottom, Permanent supportive housing PRA transfer is the two million. That's where it appears on the ordinance, folks. Okay. Just for everybody's Thank understanding. You. Please continue. Great. I just um, had trouble orienting myself as, to that as well. Thank you for that. Please continue. Okay. So as I mentioned, our goal is to really accelerate accelerate the number of affordable units that we are getting in the pipeline and into production 
throughout all of the neighborhoods in Providence. So our goal is to really have an eye towards geographic distribution, as well as some of the other factors that we'll be talking about. So just um, wanted to give this quick overview about the Providence Housing Trust. So the Providence Housing Trust is administered by the Providence Redevelopment Agency. The financing review is through the Department of Planning and Development through our finance director, Sally Brito. And Sally's here tonight to answer any questions that folks may have specific to the Providence Housing Trust. But wanted to provide this overview. I think as we as we all know, we work with closely with the Providence City Council to capitalize a $25 million bond that was closed about this time last year in February of 2021. And the intent of that bond was to provide low interest lending for affordable housing projects, both through short-term construction lending and, and also long-term project financing. Um, as we know, and um, Madam Chair, as you know from being in this business, these projects have a number of sources and a pretty complicated capital stack. So the Providence Housing Trust funds are kind of one piece of a much larger puzzle of how these projects get done. Um, so since the bond closed about a year ago, we have committed about $10 million to the following projects. So um, Paragon Mill, which is a low-income housing tax credit project um, supported by Rhode Island Housing, is a mill renovation in Onlyville. We have a $5 million allocation to that project. Um, we have a about $2.5 million allocation to Barbara Georgia II, which is a combination of a 9% and a 4% low-income housing tax credit project in Upper South Providence. And we recently closed on a, an, on a fund to Bedoin Street, which is a one neighborhood builders project under construction in Onlyville. There are a number of additional applications that are currently under review, and we can get into that um, further in the presentation, we can go through that. And then um, I think there were some questions about kind of the accounting of the, of the existing trust and that's that separate letter that you referred to earlier. So we can get into okay. some questions, but this is just meant to sort of give that high level overview. I so appreciate this. This is a great orientation for everyone. Um, okay. I just have a, a simple question on sure. regarding the math, and that is uh, very proud that the council passed the $25 million housing uh, capitalization bond. Um, that was a tremendous, tremendous project, great effort on, and we work closely with the administration to do it. And it provides, as you mentioned, a lot of these uh, deals, these projects are very complicated and it provides that critical gap financing that makes many of these projects happen. Um, so many of the uh, funding sources and resources that you utilize um, have a lot of strings attached, if you will. They're federal programs, um, they're li there's limitations to them, um, and uh, oftentimes uh, a project can't go forward for a very small amount of investment, additional investment, because that money can't be found. Um, right. So this really is critical resources and it's exciting to be able to see it put to good use. My question is, before we capitalize the bond, what was the basis in the housing trust? Before we put the $25 million bond uh, forward, what was the basis Smart. amount? Yeah, I can, um, if, if it's okay with you, Madam Chair, I would like to invite Sally Brito to um, just respond to that, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Is Sally sworn in? I am not sworn in, I'm sorry. Okay, let's we'll swear you in right now. Please raise your right hand. You swear on the penalty of perjury you got the testimony that you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing about the truth, so help me, God. I do. Sally Thank Brito. you, Sally. Okay. Uh, so basically, prior to the housing trust, there was about $2 million in funds in that account that were sitting there to be used for housing, which obviously wouldn't have funded one of these projects that we have on the board. So. Okay. So the $25 million was a big giant step forward. Correct. What is the balance in that account now? For the... Oh, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. There's about Un 19 uncommitted. million. Uh, uncommitted. Uncommitted. Yes. 16 million. Okay. Approximately. 
Okay. So my last question on this is we had requested, this went through my committee and ordinance back when I chaired the ordinance committee. Um, we had requested, part of the ordinance requires uh, quarterly reporting on this um, to the council so that we are fully aware of how these funds are being utilized. Um, where are we with getting uh, a report on this, on the math? That was the report that's provided today. That was, uh, I had discussed it with Gina and that was the report that we had put in there today. Okay, Madam Auditor, you're in receipt of the financial reporting on the trust fund, Madam Auditor? Yes, I am. I have and it's been provided for the committee, correct? Yes, you did. That's the one page document, correct? Correct. Okay, that is exhibit five committee members. If anybody has any questions relative to that, that they'd like to pose to uh, Ms. Brito at this point in time. Any hands? I can't see a hand. Madam Clerk, help me if there's anybody out there. Okay, all right, wonderful. Thank you very much for the, the uh, presentation. Um, Ms. Nickerson, please continue. That gives us a basis uh, to start our discussion today. Very helpful. Well, just wanted to also note that um, we have about um, 12 or so projects pending. So I note here on the slide, additional applications are currently under review. Excuse me, excuse me Ms. Nickerson, I see a hand. Uh, Treasurer Lombardi has a question. Please, sure, Mr. I, Lombardi. I, I, I believe I'm in receipt of um, the what the spending was um, where the spending was and uh, is this so there's like five items on this line item is that correct I mean can we get a complete breakdown of what the spending was used for I guess is the question sure breaking down each of the line items on in that exhibit to go through the accounting for each project yes because I mean there's I think there's, I mean, on the expense side, two line items. Can we, can we get the actual spending? Yep, sure. That's that's what I just went through on on the slide. But we can we can modify this letter uh, to include the items, each of the items. Yeah. So let me ask you this: Did these go out to bid through the so, board? Account? Yeah. Go ahead. No, that's okay. So um, they, it's not so much going out to bid as um, putting out a call for projects. So we have um, the guidance under the Providence Housing Trust, like I said, for short-term construction lending and long-term project financing. Um, and these were projects that were in our pipeline or had responded to a call for projects. So it's not so, it's, it's a different process than going through the board of contract and supply. Um, it's issuing a call for projects through an RFP process that's specific to the set of criteria that guide um, the, the bond, the $25 million bond. So you went to the board of contract and supply and did whatever you're talking about? Um, no, no, as I said, it's it wasn't through the board of contract and supply. It wasn't a, a it was not through that process. It was through a separate RFP process. And so how does that work? Like, aren't you required to go to the Board of Contract Supply? I, I don't believe for the, the $25 billion bond that it, it is, it is a, a separate set of guidance that guides that, the, that bond. And so we ad adhere to that guidance through the Providence Housing Trust and did a call for projects within that guidance. So it's, it's, it's outside of the Board of Contract and Supply process, but we can certainly discuss how to, how to better align that if, if there's an interest to do that. No, I'm just- Do we wondering. have a solicitor? Excuse me, do we have a solicitor on this meeting? Madam, no? Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Ms. Lombardi, please continue. That's okay, you're the chair. <laughs> But uh, Bonnie, so are you use what? So I just, I'm just wondering. So what is the criteria? So um, we can we can send that over to you. We have 
we have per the, the bond regulations, what the criteria are for, um, for the utilization of the funds. And we can send that over to, we have that as a document within the Providence Housing Trust. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm just a little confused. Didn't this council sign off on this? The council approved it, yes. So how is it not city funds requiring the city to follow their own procedures? I guess is the question. So, um, I, I, like I said, I'm happy to, to readjust, realign the procedures if that's requested, but this was sort of how we've been proceeding since February of last year. Okay. I guess I just became aware of it. So, thank you. Okay. So, thank you, uh, Treasurer Lombardi. Um, your, your questions, questions were very appropriate. We do not have a solicitor on this call tonight. I don't know why um, we have one assigned um, to this committee. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, may I please? Um, I, I'm so sorry. I believe that Ken Chavarini is on the call. He said he is muted. Okay. Yeah, he's going to mute himself. Uh, Solicitor Chavarini, could you kindly unmute yourself? So, Solicitor Chavarini, we don't have control over unmuting you. Okay, so that we do not detain everyone on this uh, meeting, um, let's follow up with this on what I would like on um, um, Director Nickerson is this summary of the finances is great. We need a deeper presentation on, um, you've, you've got a slide here, but we need this itemized as to um, the leveraging of this, these bond dollars. As we said, it was intended to be gap dollars. We need to make sure we have to be good stewards of, of these uh, funds. Uh, and we need to see all of the components of the financing for the transactions that the housing trust dollars were used for. Um, that's a really important component. That was what was contemplated under the uh, bond documents. Um, we will ask the solicitor who is muted this evening to follow up uh, on any legalities relative to Board of Contract and Supply or appropriate city procurement policies and procedures. Um, so those will be follow-up items. Madam Clerk, if you can make a notation of that, and we will continue tonight. Thank you. Uh, so let's continue. So that's the basis of the housing trust documentation. Okay. So as we discussed um, in the beginning, the proposal is a $19 million transfer to the Providence Housing Trust. So in addition to project lending, which we do in the bond account, this account would be able, as, as you noted, Chairwoman, there are um, sort of a lot of constraints around a lot of the funding sources. And so this would not just be project lending, but could also be project subsidy. So, and when we say subsidy into projects, that means a grant basically instead of a loan. And so these dollars I think would be really critical to help fill those gaps that, that you mentioned in a capital stack, which in some cases there is a small gap, um, but without, without filling out, figuring out how to fill it, the project can't move forward. So we anticipate basically being able to leverage additional units a lot faster with this additional pot of money, money that could be combined with the bond account, a, a combination of lending and subsidy into projects. Um, so as, as we noted, um, these dollars can be deployed quickly. We have the finance team in place to do this. We have the um, Providence Housing Trust guidelines. We have the, the board, the Providence Redevelopment Agency board, um, and, and have a RFP process that we will um, coordinate with you all to make sure that we're all feeling good about the process. But we have a structure in place to be able- Director Nickerson, don't need to interrupt you, but you referenced the Providence Housing Trust guidelines. Can we get a copy of that? Can you please send that to uh, to uh, uh, our auditor, as well as the clerk's office? I'd like to see those. Yep. Are those up to date? 
Yes, they are. They are specific to to the the funds within the Providence Housing Trust, and just noting that the ARPA dollars have separate requirements, but we'll go into that um, at the okay. next slide. I believe. Okay, that sounds good. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Please continue. No. And just wanted to note here that um, the PRA is going to be working with a third party underwriter to provide that sort of independent project review and analysis. And the reason why we feel like that's an important part of this is we really want to right size the subsidy target for each of the projects. So, for example, um, if a project is getting a series of other um, sources of funding from federal and state pro state um, funds. We want to make sure that that our piece of this is right sized to the project. So we've talked to LISC and some others who may be able to provide that service to us as that kind of independent um, project review so that we can all feel confident that it's the right amount of subsidy for that particular project. So just wanted to note that. Um, so, and, and also, as, as you know, <coughs> Final rule for the ARPA dollars is is um, quite clear about affordable housing being an allowable use and a priority for these dollars. So, just wanted to note that in addition to development project subsidies, other allowable uses of ARPA dollars could include, um, for example, for example, property acquisition. So, um, for we know of a project that is. Um, very well advanced and ready to go and is looking for an appropriate location. So for example, land acquisition could be an allowable use under the ARPA funds. Um, we can also consider working with, with CDCs to um, you know, work on strategic acquisitions of not just land, but perhaps um, units on the market or work with CDCs to diversify the location of affordable housing citywide. And then it's in the final rule, they also call out blighted properties. So I did want to just note that in partnership with CDCs, we can really think about um, small scale infill projects as well as these kind of large scale housing development. So we're really open to being creative about how to best utilize these dollars to fill in the gaps in all of the 25 neighborhoods throughout the city. So Ms. Uh, Nickerson, one of the things, I interrupt you again, but one of the um, things that the housing task force has been asking for is a list of blighted or um, vacant properties um, in the city, basically strategic locations. So do we have a list? We yeah, have the, that list. Yeah, the internal auditor uh, requested that in prep for the meeting. So I did provide um, to her this afternoon kind of an overview of the different categories of lots that we are tracking and the status of those categories. And then I provided two different spreadsheets. One is kind of the current status of properties that were considered within our every home program and the remaining lots and properties um, that we that are still in that program. It's, it's not quite a hundred, just under a hundred properties. And then we also included an overview of the PRA owned vacant properties. So we that we've provided to the internal auditor. Um, granted, it was it was quite late in the afternoon that I was able to get that over. So I'm not sure that she was able to get that to you. I don't think so, but that's okay. We appreciate you sending it over. Um, right. Madam Auditor, could you please confirm that you have that information? Yeah, yes, I do have it and um, I can forward it if anyone in the committee would like to review it. Okay, please do so on and let's get that to the clerk as well on um, in that, you know, that's something we've been asking for. So it is a uh, acceptable um, use of funds, upper dollars. So we want to see that. I guess one of the things that concerns me is there's a lot of things happening in the background. Uh, so there's a lot of wonderful projects. How are you prioritizing them? And how does the general public get to see what it is that you're working on and how the decisions are being made as to which project goes first or which project you know, uh, doesn't get funded. So uh, please so, explain that to, yeah. to us. Um, I think that's a great question and we'll just shift right over to project eligibility. 
So um, <laughs> one of the things we didn't play in that. It was perfect. Uh, one of the things we've been um, working with the ARPA consult consultants at iParametrics is really to understand exactly what are the boundaries around program eligibility when it comes to the housing dollars. So what we know for sure is the federal home regulations are what's called sort of safe harbor for these dollars, which means we know that the home regulations um, are, are permissible, right? And so that those home regulations that we're quite familiar with and um, everyone here is quite familiar with the utilization of home funds for projects in Providence is really targeting households earning 60% or less of area median income for rental units. And then for home ownership units, it's targeting households that make 80% of area median income or less. So we know that those are that safe harbor for ARPA funds. And we're really trying to understand if there is projects that may fall outside of that, what room do we have um, to provide support for those projects? And there does seem to be some flexibility but it sounds like those projects may require additional documentation, justification, and we're really trying to dig into that. Um, Diana can confirm, I have a five page memo in front of me that I got today that goes into that in, in more detail. So we really do wanna digest that a little bit more to really understand kind of the edges around what would be considered eligible for these dollars. So once we do have a very clear sense, um, both internally with, uh, you know, Diana's review and the consultants at iParametrics, what we would do is craft an RFP based on that project eligibility. So it'll be very clear about what types of projects are eligible. And then we would be looking to, for readiness to proceed as one of the factors. So as you know, there's a, a time frame associated with these dollars. So we would want to feel confident that these projects are able to perform within that, that window of time. And those, I would say those are going to be really the two things that we, we would put out as, as a call for projects. And then based on that, the, the other factor is going to be that review of the third party underwriter to make sure that what we're looking at with the development performer that is submitted um, makes sense, you know, is really vetted by that, by that third party review so that we feel confident that, you know, the amount of money that's being requested is right size for that project that that project's not oversubsidized. Um, those are some of the factors that we'd be looking at. And then we would um, take, take those recommendations to the um, Providence Redevelopment Agency. And we have a monthly meeting. Those monthly meetings are advertised. Those are public meetings. We take public comment at those meetings. And it would be at those meetings that we would bring recommendations forward and have a discussion with the board as to um, an, an allocation of dollars. We also, uh, one of the challenges, as you know well, um, being in, in, the, in the housing business, is that one of the challenges is um, the sort of sequencing of the different rounds of funding. So what we would imagine is that these projects are um, just rolling. So what we want to do is have um, a series of calls for projects so that you're not waiting six months you're not waiting 12 months to the next opportunity. I would imagine that it would be, you know, several times a year that we would be putting out a call for projects and inviting folks to submit, um, you know, potentially eligible projects. What we do know is that a project that may not have been ready to proceed three months ago could be ready now. And so we want to, we want to have um, many different opportunities over the course of a year for projects to submit. Um, that's one of the challenges of some of the other federal funds is that we put out a call once a year. And so, you know, some projects just miss, miss the time frame a little bit, and that can be frustrating lining up all these different funding sources. So we want to make this, um, again, we want to, we want these dollars to go out quickly and we want to get these, these projects up and running as, as quickly as possible. So that's one of the factors as well. So what provisions do you have for managing if we, yeah, let's just, just stay on this for a moment. What provisions do you have for managing on um, the components of affordable housing in those developments long term? What oversight authority uh, do you have in place? So we all know, you know, um, 
unless there's deed restrictions or other kinds of, of controls in place, how do you manage uh, those units going forward? So we know, you know, we make provisions at startup, uh, but what controls do you have in place down the road? Sure. So as we talked about, these projects have multiple different sources of funding in them. And in many cases, uh, we're going to be working with Rhode Island Housing on one of their funding sources. So, for example, if a project is a LIHTC project, a 9% or 4% low-income housing tax credit project, they have very strict um, guidance around um, deed restriction for those units, the term of the deed restriction, et cetera. So, in some cases, there is going to be a um, source of funding in the project that is even more strict in terms of either the level of affordability or the duration of affordability. Um, and in a case where we are the only dollars in the project, we would require a deed restriction for a minimum of a 20 year period. Um, and as you know, many of these projects that have a deed restricted affordable unit are seeking in you know, the 8% tax treatment and so that's sort of a double incentive that you only get that if you do have that deed restriction. And so all the dollars that we would invest um, in these units would require a deed restriction for a minimum of 20 years. That's good. Thank you. You answered that question. Okay. Please continue. Sure. Um, so just kind of in summary, we think that a combination with our existing bond funds, these additional dollars allow us to just critically address the housing shortage that we know that we've heard so much about in all the neighborhoods of Providence. Um, we have the mechanisms in place to move these dollars quickly, to approve projects and bring these units online quickly. Um, so you referenced the um, anti-displacement and comprehensive housing strategy. The funds, both from the bond funds and these additional ARPA funds really give us the opportunity to address many of those needs and priorities that were expressed through our community, through the anti-displacement and comprehensive housing strategy, which is, as you know well, is really the first time that we as a city have really identified kind of a very clear roadmap over the next 10 years of what are the programs, what are the policies, and what are the investments that we need to prioritize in Providence. Well, can I, I'm going to interrupt you again. So many members, uh, council members, it's exhibit six, that she is referring to, which is the anti displacement and comprehensive housing strategy. And could you please just give a foundation for everyone on how this came to be um, in timing and, and, and such? Because I think the most important thing that we're here for tonight is to make sure that these opera dollars comport with our overall strategy um, going yeah. forward. So, give us the foundation of how this. Um, comprehensive housing strategy came to be and how the upper dollars complement or uh, uh, provide strategies to, to uh, serve that, that plan. Yeah, thanks, thank you. So about this time last year, um, we, we finalized the anti-displacement plan. So it was about an 18 month process. We worked with a consultant and we did a series of um, large scale engagements. This was this was pre-COVID, it was about half pre-COVID and then we wrapped up um, during COVID. So um, the first half of our process was really engaging in a number of stakeholder um, workshops with sort of providers, CDCs, um, folks in the community. We worked with um, many, many different CDCs and others to engage communities that are sort of not traditionally involved in this process. We, we just had a robust community conversation about specifically what are the needs and what are the programs and um, policies that are really missing. And like I said, we, we have talked about housing in a lot of different documents. You know, we talk about it in our comprehensive plan. We talk about it in a bunch of neighborhood plans and special area plans, but we really felt that we needed a standalone document that could guide our housing policies, our programs and investments over a 10 year period. So part of the, the document that you'll see um, and the link is here as well, is really based on the demo, a deep demographic um, analysis 
of the trends, recent trends that we've seen in Providence and what we can expect to see over the coming years. So we've really worked hard to identify gaps at different income target levels and in different areas of the city and how we are going to address those gaps. And of course, um, you know, the, the bond issue and the ARPA allocation combined, it's not a magic number that solves, solves the issue, but I think at the moment right now, combined with the state of Rhode Island's kind of historic proposal of historic levels of investment in housing, we have an opportunity to make a very significant improvement in, in, the, in the status that we know we have a housing shortage for low-income families in Providence. So I think the timing of the, the issuing of the plan combined with the immediate kind of closing on the bond and now potential to invest additional funds is, is really an amazing opportunity for us to address some of these, some of these needs that, we, that we've identified, but we haven't had the additional tools so the bond and these additional ARPA dollars are really tools to, to start to chip away at what we've identified as our needs. We've identified the gaps, and this is one of the tools we can use to really start making a very significant difference to address those needs. Thank you. Any questions from council committee members, council members? Councilwoman Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you, Director, for the, the overview. Um, I know we've talked a bunch about the anti-displacement plan, so I'm curious about how um, how you're envisioning or if you're envisioning the, the capacity for these ARPA dollars to uh, like spread out. So very often we see, and, and it's like been a big trend in Providence for many years, uh, the tendency towards workforce housing, right, which emphasizes um, folks making about the area median income, which is 70-ish uh, thousand a year. Um, and I'm curious, you know, you mentioned you think that there might be flexibility, but I'm curious about like, what about on the other end? Like, are, are, can we use these ARPA dollars to maintain affordability um, at lower levels? Can we restrict some of the dollars? Can, can, when you're seeking projects to fulfill um, you know, these goals, can we say like, okay, for this RFP that we're putting out, we're looking for projects that would serve, you know, 40% of very immediate, like, are, can we think like that? And are you, and um, I have a, a few others, but those, that's. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. So yes, as I mentioned here, um, the 60% AMI targeting rental and 80% AMI targeting home ownership, those are, those are upper, upper limits for those categories. So any project targeting a 30% AMI um, group, that would certainly be eligible. And in fact, we have projects, um, you know, one of the things I mentioned is that we do have projects in our pipeline that we are currently reviewing. And so for example, one of those projects is targeted at zero to 60% AMI. So we certainly would want to see both a distribution of income targets as well as a geographic distribution around the city. So those would both be something that we'd be looking at when we put out applications. I think the challenge is to be, to be just really, really frank with kind of what are the challenges there is we know that those projects are just really difficult to finance. And so if we put out a call and all of the project proposals that we get back are, let's say, within the 60 to 80 percent AMI, because um, those are the projects that, you know, are ready to go, um, we'll have to figure out how to strike that balance between targeting that more deeper, the deeper affordable um, units and sort of having a call for projects and being able to move forward with projects that respond to the proposal. So that's the challenge there. But, but to your other point, I did, I did want to note um, the projects that are in our pipeline I've just made a list of kind of the neighborhoods. We have Upper South Providence, Fox Point, Federal Hill, the Valley neighborhood, West End, Elmwood, Downtown, Charles. So they're really scattered all over the city, which is really, really encouraging to see. Um, and so that's one of the things we'd want to look for as well. Yeah, agreed. Um, Madam Chair, can I ask a few more questions? Please continue. Thank Councilman. you. Uh, yeah, it is really nice to see the geographic um, spread. So right now for the PRA, um, the housing trust funds, are we doing, are we requiring deed restriction if, if the project has no other funding sources that require it? 
Um, and I, you know, I know 20 years can be like a standard, but our, I think that the market in Providence has shown that 20 years is uh, like a blink of an eye. Um, and so I would really encourage us to think about like long-term affordability, actually like generational long-term affordability. Um, and, and yeah. Yeah, so we do require a deed restriction. And I, what I can say is that for every project that we have um, funded through the Providence Housing Trust, it has always been in a combination with other funding sources that actually require a longer duration of, of deed restriction. So um, we've kind of piggybacked off of, of those projects, but in the case where we were a standalone funder, um, right now the minimum is, is 20 years, that's, that's how it's, it's crafted, but I, but I certainly hear your point about considering a longer deed restriction there. I think the challenge there is to right size again, the sort of the, the duration of the deed restriction with the level of funding that's being offered. Yep. You have to strike a balance there as well. Yep. Um, and then can you speak a little bit more about the 2 million for permanent supportive housing? Yeah, yeah, um, oh, I know Emily. If I can, oh. can we just get back to the presentation and counselors stay with us on uh, when they're ready to talk about that? The, oh, the, I just sure. would like to continue through. through oh, I'm I sorry, didn't... I, I should have mentioned this is my last slide. We, we're at questions. So I didn't realize that uh, it was a separate presentation. I'm happy to do that. Okay. Um, so who is presenting on permanent supportive housing? So I, I just wanted to note that Emily, Emily is here and going to be talking about some of the other housing investments. But for the permanent supportive housing, the reason why we, we carved out that, that $2 million allocation is because we do want to set aside funds that are targeted to a, uh, a lower income level, so below 60% AMI. That, had, that also has supportive services affiliated with the project. And so that's the intention with those dollars. And um, we do have a project in the pipeline that would meet those um, meet those requirements. So that that is the type of project that we're thinking of, you know, addressing that sort of zero to 60 with the combination of supportive services that, that often gets paired with those developments. Thank you. So this was a topic. This was a topic that was, uh, Councilwoman Miller. This was a topic discussed in the housing task force, uh, and I fully expected Emily to to speak about it uh, as well tonight. So I don't know if Emily, could you uh, flesh that out a little bit more? Councilor Miller has an appetite for hearing more about it, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, I think it's a critical need. Sorry. I was just noting that I was going to, if it's okay with you, stop sharing my screen. And I think Emily may um, may also have a presentation. So if it's okay, I'll just go ahead and stop sharing. You can stop sharing your screen, but we don't want you to leave us. So please stay with I'm us. I'm right here. <laughs> but that's a nice entree for Emily to join in. And now that I can see everybody, we have... Councilman Goncalves has joined us. Please let the ref uh, reflect that. And uh, Councilman Espinal is also here. Is that it? I think so. Okay. Emily. Hi, good evening. You everyone. You've been sworn in, right, Emily? I have, yes. Okay. So just to give everybody a little basis uh, for understanding on uh, this permanent supportive housing was a topic that was well discussed in our uh, housing um, emergency housing task force committee. Um, so I'm interested in hearing uh, Emily speak. And I, actually, I would like to ha have Emily make the a great presentation that I fully expect her to make on this really important topic because it's not only important to provide housing uh, for those low income uh, individuals and families, but what's critically needed is the supportive services. And we heard loud and clear from so many um, housing providers that this was a big gaping hole in our housing uh, network uh, of services. So um, I'm fully in support of this. So Emily, please take it away. Sure, thanks. And yeah, Ken Cheverini is with us. We can see you and you can unmute yourself now too. How exciting. Hi, Madam Chair. 
I just so you know, for the record, I did hear the conversation. I was muted. Okay. I will follow up with the treasurer in the morning. And, and, and just another point of clarification, Madam Chair, uh, I don't want yeah, to take sure. Emily's uh, time, but uh, last meeting you asked that I follow up to confirm if, in fact, the law department has reviewed contracts and protocols relative to the Recovery Act and the law department has. They've set a template and they will continue to review contracts and make corrections and revisions accordingly. Perfect. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you were unmuted. Okay. Appreciate Thank that. You. Emily Friedman, take it away. Hi, good evening, everyone. Emily Friedman, Department of Planning and Development, Housing and Community Development Division Director. Before we pivot into housing supports and homelessness investments, I did just want to follow up on Bonnie's presentation and note that there is a recommended $2 million set aside for the production of permanent supportive housing units. For those who may not be familiar, permanent supportive housing units are deeply affordable units targeted to those experiencing homelessness that have a service, long-term committed service and case management component. So when we do our next call for projects through the housing trust uh, with hopefully the approved ARPA dollars, the goal would be to uh, prioritize funding no less than $2 million worth of permanent supportive housing projects in our pipeline to ensure that we're bringing those physical units online as quickly as possible, because that truly is our best path forward to reduce our reliance on shelter and put folks into permanent housing solutions. So I will share my screen. Now, are folks able to see my intro slide? Yes, yes. Um, I also wanted to note Hana Khan, uh, the Deputy Director of Research and Development is in the audience and Hana is available to chime in um, with her subject matter expertise on some of these issues as well. I'm not sure if we want to promote her as a panelist and, and swear her in just in case. Absolutely, let's do that right now. Can you hear us? Hana, can you hear us? Yes. Wonderful. We're going to sway you in, Hannah. Please raise your right hand. We swear on the penalty and perjury that the testimony that you are to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to so help you, God. I do. Wonderful. Please continue, Emily. Thank you. And thanks for joining me, Hannah. I'm very happy to be here. So, to ground our conversations with the current state um, and to provide some context, as, as many are aware, the city receives entitlement funding from HUD on an annual basis that we devote to housing and community development initiatives. These are our CDBG, ESG, home and HOPWA funds. Um, and much of our historic housing investment and housing supports have been through these limited sources. As was noted earlier in 2020, the council took uh, the very exciting step to provide a dedicated annual funding stream from our TSA revenue to the Providence Housing Trust. With the infusion of that revenue stream, the Providence Redevelopment Agency was able to issue a $25 million special obligation bond to provide lending capital to affordable housing development projects, as Bonnie stated. We were also, as a city, the recipient of 2020 disaster relief funding through the CARES Act which we deployed for rapid rehousing and short-term rental and utility assistance, shelter operations, particularly overflow and non-congregate shelter, expanded street outreach and supportive services to address the impacts of the pandemic, vaccination, testing, and community health initiatives, and food security programs. Do we have a number on that, Emily? What was the dollar amount of that disaster relief funding from CARES? So we referencing uh, 3.3 .3 million in CDBG CV funding. Good question, I have it right in front of me. 3.3 uh, .3 million in CDBG CV. Excuse me, 4.7 million in CDBG CV. Uh, we also received an additional $177,000 in HOPWA. 3.3 million in ESG CV, and then we have home ARP funding of 5.9 million that we are uh, also slated to receive. Great. 
Okay. And as the council will remember, uh, we, upon passage of the first ARPA ordinance for homelessness intervention, $500,000 was set aside for an initial uh, infusion of capital into the Crossroads Rhode Island Mobile Diversion Program, which is being operationalized. So just to take, take it from the top for everybody's basis of uh, knowledge. So you referenced the, um, the TSA uh, revenue stream. So um, the council made a, uh, uh, an amendment on which to our TSA language. So all TSA agreements have a 10% set aside. So anytime a developer gets a, t uh, a TSA, they have to put 10% of their um, uh, amount that they're paying for taxes into the housing trust fund. Um, that created a basis for the trust fund. Soon after that, we recognized we needed to do more. Um, and that was pretty much the um, next round or the next approach that the council took to capitalize the uh, uh, affordable housing trust uh, fund, um, particularly since the rates were so attractive and so low, um, we went out uh, and bonded the $25 million and that capitalized the program. Emily just referenced the summary of our disaster funds. And then the last item she referenced was, if you can remember, we passed the immediate needs budget um, and 500,000 was allocated uh, for homeless intervention. So that's already, uh, that's just a basis of, of where we're at. Thank you, Emily, please continue. Thank you. So as many are aware, uh, we continue to uh, navigate this pandemic. Uh, we continue to face really unprecedented challenges. Um, the first of which is that we received funding through the CARES Act. However, those funds uh, are expiring. We anticipate needing to be closed out and fully expended by September 30th of this year. Another important date I would note is that FEMA reimbursement, which is supporting a great deal of the state's homeless uh, non-congregate shelter program is slated to terminate in April. And we do not yet have word on any, any potential extension. As a second challenge, the scope of need exceeds- the That April date is an extension though, correct? There was an extension that kicked it out to April. Yes, there's been, what's been challenging throughout this uh, pandemic has been the unpredictability associated with FEMA reimbursement. There's been multiple extensions granted. And again, we're a couple of months away from that April deadline and we have no, as far as I'm aware, no, no indication of whether or not that, that FEMA reimbursement will be extended. So as we talk about non-congregate shelter, it's concerning when we have over 200 folks uh, 200 hotel rooms in use as non-congregate shelter that potentially there may no longer be FEMA reimbursement to support that, that program. And therefore we have a, many hundreds of uh, clients who would need to be relocated to some other resource. What is the value of that? I believe it's something like $600,000 a month, if not higher. It's, it's a very substantial cost. And that would be something that would need to transition to other resources, potentially ARPA at the state level. <clears throat> so again, okay. a cause for concern when, when we're entering February and we don't know what's going to happen in April. Have you added that to this budget? Is that contemplated within this opera bucket? No? It is yeah. not. But something again, you know, cause for cause for anxiety and and necessitating us to all be collectively planning ahead and partnering with the state on, on all of this work. I, okay, I think that that's something we need to focus on. To me, that's an immediate need. Uh, I know it was exciting when the, when the uh, deadline was extended, but you're right, April's just around the corner. Okay, please and continue. Independent of these, this surge in resource, the scope of need continues to outpace the amount of investment that we've been making. And our recovery needs are obviously going to extend beyond the next 12 months and certainly beyond April and certainly beyond the September termination of CARES funding. Another challenge- how are, we, how are we coordinating with the state on this 
topic. How are we, they have a bigger bucket of funds. Uh, are we making sure that we get our fair share of state dollars on this uh, for housing, particularly uh, emergency shelters and, and such? We do liaise with the, with the state and the governor's office regularly. Uh, we certainly work in close concert with the state's Office of Housing and Community Development. I'll get into our partnership with the Consolidated Homeless Fund, where entitlement communities in the major cities in Rhode Island partner with the state to ensure that homeless investments uh, cover the scope of need from one corner of the state to the other. Um, but yes, that is something we, we certainly are prioritizing um, and working on as a collective group. Okay. And, and certainly challenge number three, uh, this is no surprise. We knew prior to the pandemic that we were facing a housing crisis and that we had a critical shortage of affordable housing units. This shortage is most acute for households earning under 30% of area median income, our lowest extremely low income households. And this has only been further exacerbated by the pandemic. This is the population hardest hit by the pandemic. So our, our anti-displacement and comprehensive housing strategy that's been referenced many times tonight uh, that was completed actually prior, right about when the pandemic started, um, at that time projected a shortage of over 7,000 price appropriate units for those earning at or below 30% AMI by 2030. And this was prior to the economic downturn. As we know, we have continued growing rates of unsheltered homelessness and system capacity limitations. Emily, let's just go back, okay? So <clears throat> the housing strategy said basically the goal was 7,500 units by 2030. Now that we have opera funding and the state has opera funding, how many more units can we uh, make available? What is the revised goal, I guess, um, and, and, you know, can we do it sooner? So what is the math on that? What are you working on? So really what's gonna be critical is that we are providing subsidy to, sorry, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulties, bear with me. What's going to be critical is that we're providing gap financing for these affordable development deals so that we're leveraging all the capital that's available for affordable housing investment. It's very difficult to build 7,300 units with the resources we have solely at the city. It requires leveraging private capital, Rhode Island housing funding. Um, and so our goal is to try to get as close to that 7,300 as possible. Sorry, are you all still with me? I'm before we had opera dollars. I, I just want to reaffirm. That was the goal before we had opera dollars. Now we have these opera dollars. How has that target changed? Madam, Madam Chair, could I jump in on, on that question? Absolutely. I, I think what we're basically saying is when we identified this, this shortage of 7,300 units, that was an overwhelming number that we did not have the resources to really make a very significant dent in, frankly, it's, it's an overwhelming number. But we, what we're saying is with this very significant infusion of funding from the state and city level combined, we can make a very significant dent in that number a lot faster. And so can we hit this target by 2030? I think we're still not sure if that's possible, given the amount of dollars that are going to be allocated to Providence. Um, but what we can do is make a very significant dent a lot sooner than we would have been able to. So um, it's, a, it's a huge opportunity, but, but it, is, it is real. The challenge is real. And I think, you know, those numbers are, are kind of shocking, um, but it, it does just, you know, make us really face, face the reality of what the shortage is. So just let me point out, first of all, the slide that is in front of everyone says 73 uh, price appropriate units. The 313 page document that is an exhibit uh, to this body has uh, 7,500. So there is a discrepancy there. I don't know what the right number is. Does any, do, do you folks know which one is correct? 
Is it 73 or is it 73? I apologize. There are two typos in the presentation that was sent to you a few weeks back. I okay. uh, messed up the date on the front page, and then this figure should have been 7,300. That comports to okay. the fact you would see on page 20 of the comprehensive housing strategy. So everyone should change their one page 130, 179 of the 313 page exhibit to 7,300. So I guess that gets me to the question. I thank you, Bonnie, for that explanation, but I want to know what these upper dollars are providing in homes. Uh, what does the math work out to? Because you've had to have made some uh, projections um, on the usage of these funds. I, I recognize on you know the trust uh, the trust fund transfer, if you will. Uh, it really depends on, on the uh, developments that come before you, but you have to have some baseline uh, metric for measuring whether it is effective in, in you know, creating a certain number of units. So I'm in interested in knowing what those numbers are. Do you have them for the committee's consumption tonight or do you want to get back to us on that? I, I think we can get back to with a, a more comprehensive answer, but I think you Thank know, you. It, it gets back to right sizing the level of subsidy per unit. And that's really where um, where we're sort of focused. But let's let's get some real numbers to you. I get the right sizing. I understand that. But as elected officials, we have a duty and an obligation to make sure these funds are spent as best possible. And for us, we need a measurement. We need a metric. Um, so I'm looking for that type of analysis for our consumption. So I would appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Emily, I'm sorry, I interrupted you again. Please continue. No, no, no apologies necessary. I just wanna confirm everyone is still able to see the presentation with the screen share. Yes, <laughs> explanation of challenges is in front of us. Perfect, I, I had a minor technical difficulty. I apologize. Uh, no worries. All still working. Okay. okay. Challenge four is before us. Uh, so as those who have been following this issue, either in the press or through our housing crisis task force work, uh, we are experiencing growing, continued growing rates of unsheltered homelessness coupled with system capacity limitations. At the onset of the pandemic, we had to reduce our inventory of shelter beds by 146 to accommodate CDC social distancing to ensure the safety of all clients. And the timeline for the restoration of those beds is still uncertain. So again, lot, loss of capacity in our system, at the same time, seeing more and more clients than we've ever seen before. As a concern, uh, as the pandemic grinds on, uh, the eviction moratoriums that were in place during the beginning of the pandemic have expired. So prior to the pandemic, there were approximately 8,300 evictions a year, about a quarter of which were within the city of Providence. Post-pandemic, advocates are estimating this number is going to rise to potentially 15,000 in the state of Rhode Island in 2022 and beyond. And again, there are no legal protections uh, or moratoriums in place at this time, preventing displacement. On any given night in the state of Rhode Island, our shelters are at almost 100% capacity and the lack of available beds and a lack of available appropriate housing units is creating log jams throughout the system. In a recent period in December, there were 503 clients identified as unsheltered, living in places unfit for human habitation in the coordinated entry system. At the time I wrote this out, uh, presentation, there were about 150 hotel rooms in use. Since that time, that has been further expanded to well over 200 and is still not keeping up with demand. And as a general point, uh, in consult consultation with the Rhode Island Coalition to End Homelessness, we determined that approximately 40% of people experiencing homelessness in the state of Rhode Island are Providence residents, consider Providence to be their home. 
So within the ARPA ordinance, you will see line items under the $28.1 million section uh, labeled emergency housing solutions, $1 million, and expand rapid rehousing, $4 million. And the goal would be to provide additional resources that would enable us to work with partners to expand our non-congregate shelter models, our diversion and housing navigation programs to add capacity to homeless services and enable quicker transition or avoidance of the shelter system. $4 million in rapid rehousing is recommended uh, to sustain the investment we've been making with ESG CV funds to provide mid, what we consider midterm rental assistance that's paired with case management, which is really a best practice in transitioning those experiencing homelessness out of shelter and into housing, into private housing. Rapid rehousing to get into particulars is designed to end the incidence of homelessness quickly. It's typically structured as rental assistance or first month's rent security or landlord risk mitigation or utility deposits with the goal of obtaining permanent private housing. That's also coupled with relocation and stabilization services, including housing case managers who develop landlord re relationships, assist the client with housing search and monitor the progress for housing plans. Uh, with ESGCV, we were able to fund Crossroads, Amos House, and Sojourner House with, with funding to provide rapid rehousing services. And again, the concern is as ESGCV funding and other funding uh, terminates, there is no plan to continue sustained investment in these very meaningful and impactful programs. As we referenced earlier, we work uh, as the capital city need to work very closely with our state partners. Recognizing this, uh, when we initially launched and started to receive emergency solutions grants, our funding for homelessness that we receive on an entitlement basis, the, si the city along with uh, the city of Pawtucket and Woonsocket and the state office of housing and community development formulated what's called the Consolidated Homeless Fund, which is a funding consortium that enables us to provide one-stop funding process for homeless service providers and fosters a single coordinated effort to address homelessness across our state. So through the Consolidated Homeless Fund, we deploy ESG funding, uh, this should say, excuse me, Title 20 funding and State Housing Resources Commission funding. In terms of homelessness investments, we are also able to leverage Medicaid reimbursement for home stabilization and case management services, as well as the Treasury Rent Relief RI funds um, can also serve homeless clients. So with these investments, we anticipate being able to serve an additional 175 individuals and 120 families. And again, the goal would be to transition folks out of shelter and into permanent private housing. And the eligibility is, uh, for these investments is specifically called out on page 83 of the treasury final rule. So it is an eligible investment. As another uh, priority for the city um, that was identified within our comprehensive housing strategy, we also need to ensure that our existing housing stock, private housing stock is safe, healthy and habitable. So you will see a line item within the ARPA ordinance for additional investments in home repair. Uh, within the comprehensive housing strategy, there were multiple recommendations around home repair and housing quality, uh, which were expanding our existing owner occupied housing rehab program to increase the number. Can I just, can I interrupt you please? On um, these, the line items, affordable alternative housing programming, emergency housing solutions, expand rapid rehousing, right to council, permanent supportive housing. Are those dollar amounts sufficient? Are you happy with those amounts or do you need more money there? I just would like you to testify what your need is to address your uh, need for opera dollars to address what you know to be our immediate challenges to make sure that 
you know, folks are, are uh, provided safe, habitable uh, living quarters in the city of Providence. Is this solve our immediate needs or do you need more? And I, I need say, you to be frank sure. because you're testifying. Across all categories, uh, we need more. However, obviously with ARPA dollars, there is a tight spending timeline. And what we don't want to do is put ourselves in a position where we are leaving dollars unspent or on the table. So what the line items that are recommended are proportional to what we feel like we can deliver uh, with good customer service in compliance with the ARPA regulations. We feel comfortable with these line items as being appropriate and balancing those considerations. And you'll have contracts with all of these partners that provide these services, and you've got metrics for measuring uh, performance? Absolutely. It should be stated that ARPA regulations require rigorous reporting. Uh, in most cases, many of these initiatives we're also already implementing to some extent in-house, um, and, and we are, uh, you know, there is strict eligibility requirements that will follow the ARPA dollars reporting requirements, as I mentioned. Um, and certainly if we don't have the bench strength internally to implement any of these programs, then we would look to outside partners via an RFP to find uh, those that would have the capacity and ability to deliver on our behalf in the short timeline uh, between now and the close out of ARPA. Okay. Please continue. Thank you, Emily. So within the comprehensive housing strategy, there were multiple recommendations, as I mentioned, on home repair need within the city of Providence. Um, so again, there was a recommendation to expand our existing owner-occupied uh, housing rehab program, which we currently fund with CDBG at a small scale to increase the number served, because as we know, year over year, we have a waiting list for that program um, and are never able to serve as many households as inquire or or seek to apply. So Emily, um, the council created that or added that to the CBDG. I remember testifying on that. Uh, so how much, is it two, two million that we use uh, for home repair in the CDBG? What is the amount of the, in the last budget that we uh, passed? In the last budget, 350,000. 350, okay. So, and the city manages the, the home repair uh, program, correct? Yes, we implement can that. About, so can you talk about what that looks like? Because sure. this is basically adding on, providing more dollars for an existing program, right? Sure. Is it my so, correct? That's a uh, potential use. Um, there are really sort of four uh, uses, I would say, that are recommended on the comprehensive housing strategy. Um, the first of which is to expand that existing program to owner occupants. There is a recommendation in the comprehensive housing strategy to offer a standalone energy efficiency program, uh, which I believe the sustainability office will talk to you a little bit about. A need for targeted investments to enable our seniors to age in place and make necessary home modifications. And then what we haven't had in the past is a rental rehab program. So a, a program specifically geared toward our investor owned properties that have housing code violations. And the goal would be to couple that with more proactive code enforcement to try to address uh, housing, uh, se severe housing quality issues in our rental housing. As you mentioned, we do have a small scale home repair program for owner occupants currently operated out of the housing and community development division here in the city. That is funded with approximately $300,000 to $350,000 in CDBG per year. Through that program, we are able to offer deferred payment 0% interest loans to income eligible homeowners up to $25,000 per property. So for the benefit of our listening public, if someone gets cited for housing code violation and they end up in housing court, this is a tool to make available a 0% uh, loan to people to address the housing code violation uh, without putting them into any kind of a, a spiral. Um, Absolutely. So, okay. 
Thank you. And what's the um, what is the dollar amount for each uh, for each person who gets or qualifies for the program? Currently, we have a twenty five thousand dollar loan cap. Okay. And it's for and the, eligible homeowners. So similarly uh, to ARPA, right now that it looks as though the guidelines are going to be eighty percent AMI or below. So it will and be what about seniors? What about seniors? Do they get any special carve out or do they get any priority? So the recommendation with the comprehensive housing strategy is to create a standalone program, uh, specifically targeting the needs of seniors who are looking to age in place in their home. So make necessary modifications to reduce uh, trip and fall hazards, ensure that their properties are well maintained. And as we know, the majority of our seniors in Providence are income qualified for these types of programs. They are living on fixed income, social security, um, and, and are struggling with the rising cost of repairs. So this is a particular carve out that really is warranted, especially as our population ages. So how many people, how many families, how many individuals do we serve with the CDBG home repair program annually? Uh, it varies year to year, but it's typically around 25. Not a whole heck of a lot. Okay. Uh, so this home repair line item here is 3 million. So it's less than 25 people could be served. Is that correct? So this is 10 times the amount of what we're currently spending. So again, we would expect to see a significant increase in the number served. But you said it was 3.5 million in the, uh, in the CDBG. 350,000, okay. I'm sorry, thank you for that correction. It's, very, it's a small program at the current scale, uh, okay. which could be, of course, scaled up. And certainly we are seeing the demand for the program. We're seeing demand across uh, really all of, the, all of the needs that I mentioned, seniors, energy efficiency, rental properties, there is a demand um, for this type of lending. So I think the lending is appropriate. What concerns me is what do you have in what's intended with the fund expanded rehab lending in parallel with more proactive code enforcement, rental registration, certificate of habitability pilot? What is that about? I like the aging in place initiative. That sounds good. What's rental registration and certificate of habitability? What is that? Intended. Madam, Madam Chair, could I take that one? Yes, um, before I have hands up on um, Councilwoman Miller, um, should I continue with this line of questioning or do you wanna go someplace else? No, I just have one quick question about this. Sure. Thanks, Madam Chair. So uh, thanks, Emily, too. Um, how many people, about how many people are um, left on the waiting list every year? Do you have a sense of that, like off the top of your head? Oh, yes. Uh, I would say it's about 80. Okay. And, and, and that's without aggressive marketing of the program. Right. It, does, the, does the waiting list go from year to year? Like if, if do they have to reapply or they stay on the list? So at this point, what we do is take names and numbers because under HUD guidelines, your application materials essentially only last and are only valid for 30 days. So what we don't do is have you go through a whole application process if we don't feel like we're gonna be able to process your loan in a timely manner, uh, because we don't wanna create an undue burden. So we take names and numbers uh, and we, at this point, because of the demand for the program, we prioritize on the basis of emergency and then we prioritize on the basis of first come first serve. Um, so with the referrals we get from the council office, MCCS, housing court code, really we are, you know, the 25 we serve per year at this point are the most dire emergencies. Those who are in a no heat situation because their boiler has failed or have a sewer or water line failure um, and are really dealing with a, a pretty dire emergency. And that's where the program right now is, is sort of specializing. But certainly there's, you know, probably 80 inquiries a year. Um, and a lot of demand for the program and that's without an aggressive marketing plan. And it's not, um, so I know it's owner occupied, but if someone has like a triple decker that they live in an apartment of, 
that uh, that still applies to all three units, yeah? So, I know I preferred people in that situation, so I just want to clarify. Yes, yeah, so with HUD guidelines, which is the, the funder for CDBG, uh, we are able to assist a property if it's at least 51% lower moderate income. So with a triple decker, if two out of the three units are income qualified, we can assist that property. Got it. Thank you so much. Thank you. All set, Councilman. Thank you. Um, I see um, our auditor, um, Gina Costa, has her hand up. Do you have yes. a question? Um, yes, I do. Um, Emily, you said that these are low or zero percent income loans. Do they ever get paid back, and where do they go? They do. Uh, we we've been operating the program regularly. I would say for the last five or six years. Um, so it's not getting paid back to the scale where it's a revolving fund quite yet, but we do generate a, what's called program income at a level of about 40, 40 to $60,000 a year in repayments. And that money is, is program income to the CDBG program that is put back through our budget process. Okay, thank you. All set, great. Okay, please continue. I think uh, Bonnie was gonna take the, uh, Mike on this one, on yeah, my question. I, yes, I just wanted to note um, on this line item that talks about um, the expanded rehab lending in parallel with more proactive code enforcement. What Emily's referring to here is in the comprehensive housing strategy, we identified specific initiatives that could be partnered with additional funding. So in this case, um, as we know, the demand is there for expanded rehab lending with or without these additional programmatic um, sort of pairings. So I can just note that we're exploring this idea of a rental registry certificate of habitability. We have not launched those. Um, that's something that we are investigating right now, but we certainly um, have the demand to expand rehab lending with or without those additional programs. So just wanted to Can you clarify. explain? Could you explain those programs? What's contemplated there? Yeah. So um, the idea is that the um, the rental units themselves would be registered in the Department of Inspection and San of Inspection and Standards and would have to go through a process to get what's called a certificate of habitability. And what that would ensure is sort of a baseline of code compliance for the, the rental housing stock in the city. So we've looked at um, examples of this across the country, and there are some pros and cons that we are evaluating it, but that's the general idea that we would have a very good sense of our rental housing stock because all rental units would have to go get this certificate of habitability. So that's a really expensive process. Uh, quite honestly, if, you know, housing stock is important, uh, we all know uh, just about every council person struggles with um, inspections and standards, getting them out to houses when there's code problems and, and getting them addressed. And it's a time consuming uh, project or process. Mm -hmm. So the issue on this topic, um, quite honestly, is now we're proposing to go out and, and certify every rental unit in the city of Providence, the challenges of that logistically, operationally, manpower is enormous. Uh, I don't think we have the bandwidth to support that. Um, and also the, the negative side of it is, um, I mean, the positive side of it is all of our housing stock is up to code and perfect. But the reality is we have a number of bad players um, or a few bad players. Um, we need to focus our energies and efforts on the bad players uh, and use our manpower to make sure that if we have a house that is not up to code, that we, you know, address it immediately. Um, so it is a challenge. It's a complicated um, endeavor, I think. Um, and I think that, uh, I think it's beyond the scope of opera funding. I really do. But we can talk about that further. Um, and you said you're just contemplating it. It's not uh, something yeah, that, that uh, you're committed to. Right, that's something, all of the points that you bring up are things that we're really evaluating. What would it take 
in order for us to do that effectively and efficiently for all of the rental housing stock. So those points that you bring up are the ones we're evaluating. So I think that the other um, components of this funding have tremendous merit. You know, the, um, the uh, uh, assistance to, to, for homeowners and residents to, to, to address uh, housing code enforcement issues, that home repair program is, is fantastic. I also think that, uh, you know, helping our seniors is tremendously uh, important and helpful. Um, and I'd like to see, I personally would like to see that $3 million be spread um, across those components, as opposed to worrying about bringing in another uh, program that could potentially be extremely costly and difficult to manage. I see Councilman Espinal's hand up. Councilman, you're muted, sir. You are muted, sir. We can't hear you. Yep, there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just, just a quick question in regards to that new program that is being contemplated. Is that something that would require an ordinance? Would that go through uh, council approval or is that just a policy from PRA or the Department of Inspection and Standard? That's a good question. And I do think it would actually require an ordinance, but we are looking into that. But I, I, I think that would make sense that if we were to launch this program, that it would be an ordinance that the city council would pass. All right, thank you. Councilman, this has been talked about before and it would require an ordinance. So I can uh, attest to that as well. My, my concerns in regards to that would be <laughs> the US press, Chairwoman, uh, very concerning. Thank you. Okay, what else do you have for us, Emily? Thank you, Bonnie. What else do you have? Thank you all. Um, and really the goal with the, with the rehab investments would also be to leverage some of the other pools of funding that exist to address healthy housing issues. So we have a lead grant through HUD for our Lead Safe Providence program. We have the Providence Water Lead Line Replacement Program. And then there is the Community Action Partnership with Providence County Weatherization Program. And really the goal would be to try to braid all of these resources to make uh, investments within our housing stock in Providence to address the many healthy housing issues that we know exist. Um, and this is eligible and enumerated in the treasury guidance, pages 84 to 85. And then additionally, there was a recommendation from the task force to set aside a fund for an RFP for affordable and alternative housing programming with the goal of soliciting for community driven proposals through community based organizations to serve impacted households in hardest hit neighborhoods to provide an opportunity for creative and innovative solutions uh, driven by the community as opposed to the city departments. How are you going to manage that? How are you going to administer that? So that would be a competitive RFP, similar to the way we issue a notice of funding availability for CDBG or other resources, and really doing a call for projects from community-based organizations. Um, and uh, there were a number of proposals that were submitted by community-based organizations as part of the uh, input process for, and the task force's work. And I think that the goal was to try to provide a resource to fund some of those proposals and give an opportunity to formally apply for a number of those initiatives. Can we see some of them as examples? I would, could I ask Diana? Diana, could you maybe chime in on some of the proposals that were suggested that came from community-based organizations? Please. Sure, happy to help. Um, yeah, so I can I could happily follow up with some of the proposals that were actually submitted through the website. There was a section of the American Rescue Plan, the Providence Rescue Plan site, that you could actually submit a specific proposal from an organization or even an idea that you'd like to fund. And so um, our consultants, SCS, Assistance Change Strategies, actually consolidated a lot of that information. Um, so I could happily ask them to um, look at that report and I'll send it to you all following this meeting. Um, we, we have that available and can share with you the specifics. I think it, um, on the Thursday meeting, I shared just a very brief 
example. Um, one that I think kind of highlights where it doesn't quite fit in within the categories listed here, but um, was of interest. So we heard from an, an, an organization with regard to how to support elderly um, in housing in place. So say you live in a large house, but it's just you now and you have a number of spare bedrooms. Can you get support in renting those bedrooms out to say a college student or someone who needs a more affordable uh, one bedroom unit? So those are the types of proposals that were sent, but happy to follow up um, and share with what we received through our community engagement process. And, and we'll send that to you um, later this week. Thank you, Diana. Okay. Um, Madam Auditor, you have your hand up. Would you like to uh, say something? Uh, yes, I have a couple of questions. Um, Emily, um, you mentioned CDBG and the RFP processing. Following up on something the Treasurer asked earlier, are you required to go to the city's Board of Contract and Supply for CDBG? CDBG, I think, is a unique example because we, through the ERP process actually develop an independent budget ordinance and is actually approved by full council. So essentially the BOCS process would be a little bit redundant where the full council has voted on every line item, every sub grant. Uh, right. as, through the, through the as, as long as the vendor is identified by, I don't disagree, but I have a question maybe for Diana. Um, Diana, the ARPA money is federally funded. If we're transferring it to, say, the PRA, which doesn't follow the, the traditional board of contract and supply bid process, are we allowed, and is that still eligible spending, or should they go through the board of contract and supply in compliance with the city rules and possibly federal law? Yeah, that, that is a very good question. And what I can say is that I understand that different municipalities um, and localities are approaching this in, in different ways. Um, so I understand that, um, you know, for instance, Albany um, is treating this as a federal grant program and they are not getting any approvals through their council or their, you know, local uh, procurement process for a lot of their ARPA spends in a similar fashion that you would see something that like CDBG dollars have been used in a way where after it goes through a process and then working with the council to approve those kind of funds. Um, so it really varies by jurisdiction. I think here in Providence, we wanna make sure that we work very closely with you all because we know that you all care very much about these resources. And so what we're proposing through the ordinance has been and, and will be going through our typical um, city procurement processes, um, except for when there are opportunities that have different types of spending mechanisms, such as the PRA process. So I would let Bonnie speak more to how PRA procures those services. But um, my understanding is that there's a lot of gray among municipalities and how they're approaching this with their local councils. Is, may I continue, Madam Chair? I'm sorry. Absolutely. Please do. Um, is there any way you can reach out to your consultants and get an opinion? Um, because if we have to repay back $17 million or $4 million, um, in the future, I, I would hate to see that uh, be impacted to future administrations. Absolutely, happy to ask the iParametrics to provide an opinion or just overview of how cities are doing this um, and to clarify you know, how we need to comply with those, the guidance from the federal government. Okay, and one last question also, Diana. You mentioned student housing as low-income housing. Are you saying that student housing is qualifying for the low-income housing in the opera funds? No, no, that, that is not what I mean. Um, I think what I intended to say was as an example of a program that came up okay. in the proposal um, that, you know, say you're an elderly individual who has extra spare bedrooms and you'd like to be able to keep your housing affordable, <laughs> could you rent those bedrooms to someone who's willing to pay a small rent and keep your housing affordable? It was an example of a program that was submitted to us in a proposal. <laughs> Um, the guidelines would focus on the affordability for the individual being impacted. So that would be the elder, elderly individual um, who would be receiving the support to make their housing affordable. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. No more questions. So I would also like the solicitor to opine on that for us. I know um, I'm just adding on to, to the auditor's request um, as well as the actual transfer to the uh, PRA if we can do that. Um, all right, uh, thank you, sir. Next, can please continue, Emily. Thank you. And then finally, in terms of line item investments, uh, the final recommendation is 
continuing and expanding protections to prevent loss of housing. So continuing our successful right to counsel pilot, which has been providing no cost legal aid services to prevent displacement. Uh, through this investment, we'll be able to continue to invent, leverage the state's rent relief RI rental assistance program and ensure that eviction defense lawyers are providing pro bono, no cost of client assistance um, in enrolling in that program and negotiating agreements with landlords to cancel or postpone their eviction and avoid displacement during a period of time where resources are scarce and affordable housing and alternative units are not readily available. So obviously keeping people within their homes uh, and avoiding displacement is a critical investment at this time. And by continuing this right to council pilot over the next few years, we anticipate approximately 2000 households being able to be served uh, through our legal aid partners. Great. <clears throat> Do you see, uh... So you've got the impact for this right to counsel, and I think you had uh, impact on another uh, piece of, of your presentation. Um, I'd like to see impact on every single line item. Um, so please provide that to the auditor uh, if you can. We talked about it earlier. Okay, any questions, uh, committee members? Do you wanna? Are you done? Are you done, Emily? Essentially, yes. Okay, so we've got, uh, I see a hand, Councilwoman Anthony. Yes, I'd just like to say these presentations have been excellent. Thank you so much. Um, can we have the slide deck? Can that be sent to us on both the director and on Emily's uh, presentation? Happy to email it individually to the clerk for, for dissemination. I, I believe it's part of a larger packet, but happy to send. It is. Council, it's part of your package. Uh, Slide deck? The, yeah, the, the 313 page document that didn't have pages that now has pages, that's it. That's what they're doing. I wasn't following um, along on the packet, but thank you. That's, that's all I need. Thank you. Is that all, you're good? You're all set? Yep, thank you. Okay. All right, so Emily, thank you. Uh, any other comments, Emily or uh, Director Nickerson? Any any other anything else you want to say? <laughs> so I think committee member. I'm sorry. Committee members, council members, any comments, questions for our presenters? No. Okay, um, I think that's that's a wrap on that. Um, I would like to thank you very much for appearing before the Finance Committee on um, and providing the information that uh, you already have. Uh, it's quite a, uh, a bit of information and I wanna um, just thank you for your presentations. Uh, very informative and we appreciate, we appreciate that. Uh, and Diana, I know that you had the tough job last week. Now my voice is going, so I, I understand. <laughs> um, I understand your pain. But I think that's a wrap on housing. Um, we may have you back if we have other questions. Um, but now I think um, we'd like to hear, it's getting late in the evening at 7.30. Does my committee feel like we can get through this on uh, uh, the piece from uh, Director Silveria on revenue recovery. It's a really important piece. I don't, I continue it if, if the committee would like to do that. Committee members, I'm asking, taking a poll. Are you with me? Do you want to stay? You want to cover it? You want to push it? Yes, you want to continue? My vice chair says move forward. Okay, with that, without further ado, um, Director Silveria, could you please, uh, you provided a very brief summary at our last meeting. Uh, could you please uh, provide further uh, comments on the revenue recovery piece? It's an important piece of this grant, uh, but we'd like to hear from you. Um, yes, um, so I have uh, it was included, I think, in last week's 
submission. So it should be in the packet, but um, my deputy is going to share her screen so we can see. <clears throat> can you tell us what page it's on so that we can get there quick? I am not for the page number on that, but um, I'm not sure if everyone can see the screen share, but my um, deputy, Crystal Lindbergh, has shared. 308. Her. It's 308. <laughs> okay. Okay, so Crystal, if you can advance to the next slide. Okay, so the provision for uh, revenue loss, the final rule um, confirms what the interim final rule stated, which was that recipients may use payment from the fiscal recovery funds uh, for the provision of government services. Um, it's calculated on a formula which compares actual revenues received against pre-pandemic level revenues plus an assumed growth rate. And so that base year that we're using is 2019. It's the uh, last full fiscal year before the pandemic hit. Um, the growth rate that we are to use is the higher of the three years preceding the pandemic or 5.2%. So that 5.2% was a change um, from the interim final rule. They increased that percentage for us. Um, and just to note here, the city's growth rate was approximately 2% for the three years prior to the pandemic. And when we calculated the amount needed for fiscal 21 budget, we assumed a 3% growth rate on um, year over year. Um, next slide. And the Treasury's final rule confirms the that all general revenue loss is due to the pandemic. Um, the calculation is defined as revenues received from all revenue streams except for um, refunds or correcting transactions, proceeds from debt issuance or sale of investments, agency or private trust transactions, and payments from the federal government. Um, and Treasury has recommended this approach to minimize the administrative burden across um, for municipalities, provides greater consistency, and presents a more accurate overall representation of impact. The uses of revenue loss, uh, revenue loss available to maintain general government services, and that includes, but it's not limited to, maintenance or pay-go funding, funded building of infrastructure, health services, environmental remediation, school or educational services, and public safety. It also states that government services are those the recipient um, government was generally providing pre-pandemic, and it excludes certain um, uses of this art money for revenue loss, which is um, reducing taxes, um, deposits into pension funds, debt service and replenishing reserves, and settlements and judgment. So we calculated the immediate and future needs. We had already asked and got approval to bring 19.4 million into the fiscal 22 budget. And then in determining the fiscal 23 and 24 amounts needed, we really relied on our five-year plan. So this uh, finance team sat down, we did a thorough um, projection for the next five years. We took an, about an average 2% growth rate um, year over year for fiscal 23 and 24, which is in line with where we were before the pandemic. Um, and so that is how we came up with our number there. And, and so we also, I kind of wanted to be conservative here because we know this revenue isn't forever. And so we know we need to get to a place where we're no longer relying on this revenue and able to support the city's general fund budget going forward. Um, and so, um, and so that's where we are. So that's how we determined the amount that we would need for the next couple of years while we are continuing to recover and while we have these um, funds available to us to support our, our services. Thank you. Madam Auditor, do you have any questions? Um, I do not, but, uh, well, I'm sorry. Yes, I do. <laughs> Sarah, um, if we were to go into a million dollar deficit proje um, projection by end of year 2024, would we have the capability to make it up using the opera funds? Um, we could, it would require an ordinance amendment to be able to do that. Um, so we'd have to look at our overall spending and, and make some adjustments there. Yeah. Okay. So, so we haven't maxed out the amount of revenue 
um, that we could capture for. No. no. Okay. We, we I, use the instead of the 5.2% maximum, so we're well within the, the limits of what we could, we could use. Okay. And I actually do support not monopolizing all the money for revenue. We need to learn how to get this revenue back and establish our own funding so we're not relying on the government, the federal government any further. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Well said, Madam Auditor. Um, thank you, uh, Director Silveria. Um, I do, I agree in that regard. Um, I appreciate the conservative approach, um, but the money is there should we need to, the, the, the uh, ability to dig deeper should we have a, a, a catastrophic issue. Um, Chief Mancini, do you wanna opine on this? Um, Madam Chair, good evening, and members of the Finance Committee, and uh, good evening to the panel of it. Uh, I'm in full support of the analysis. Uh, Ms. Lindbergh and Ms. Lindbergh have provided a continuous review of that matter and have watched it closely. Obviously, we all hope and uh, expect that we will not need to draw of it as large as it's been expected and if that should not occur. And we agree with the internal order that we would be conservative in approaching uh, <clears throat> because the concern there is as, as is mutual to us that uh, there is a time when we have to rebuild and get back to the normal revenue stream. So we're in full support of that. Thank you. Wonderful. Committee members, thank you very much, Chief. Uh, committee members, any questions? Council members, questions? Wonderful. Um, I think that does it. Um, I think what I'd like to do, Madam Clerk, is continue this item. Should we want to come back um, and bring it back at a later point? So. Um, without any further questions, um, may I entertain a motion to continue item one? May I have a motion to continue? Motion so made moved. to continue item one, seconded so by Second. uh, Councilman Taylor. Thank you very much. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. We've continued item one. We've completed all our charges this evening in a very expedient fashion. Um, great presentations by all. With that, I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn. So motion moved. made by Council uh, Majority Leader Taylor, seconded by Vice Chair Castillo. You were a little slow out of the gate. Um, 